one common concept, and that being faith. And uh, there's a big difference between religion and faith. Uh, faith is something you believe in, religion is something you practice. At times they can be synonymous, at times they can be entirely different. Uh, myself, I'm converted to Catholicism, but this is by no means a church sermon. If that's what you were expecting tonight, I'd recommend coming back here tomorrow at 10 a.m. Because <laughs> you're not going to get it. The basic outlines and the only rules for this was you can praise it, doubt it, question it, praise it. You just can't bash it. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do Ephesians book 2. Often I believe, but I must ask, I believe, but I must wonder, I believe, but at times I doubt. I believe, but wonder why the wine bottles keep piling up in the corner. I believe and I want to preach. I believe the wonder at times when these are the times I lose my voice. I believe and sometimes flat out ask why. I'm not looking for a burning bush. Just completely skipped a paragraph. <clears throat> I believe, but if I'm really created, Christ Jesus to do good works. Why have you created this broken machine that seems incapable of producing anything? Able to survive, but fail at living. Able to pick myself up, but keep from falling. I'm not looking for a burning bush. Just a sign of something that times will improve. Prayers will be answered and sleep obtained without pills. That this system of pulleys and levers made of tongue and flesh makes something a product, even if only be for a single night. Where they can shut down for maintenance and be metaphorically tuned, rewound, as the rain falls and I put out another cigarette I can't afford, I believe. But I'm still too afraid to pray and ask as I stopped asking questions years ago based on the, sp the responses received. So I, as Jesus often did while performing miracles and healing, will remain mute. As I cannot do things like this and clearly offer no comparison between the two of us, though I believe, but have been granted the gift of free will, which at times wish there was a receipt for, so I may exchange at times when broke, homeless, or lying in hospital beds. I wonder if I was prepared for something to do. What it was, I believe, though can't hold a steady job and terrible in relationships. What I know for certain is that I was born Scotch-Irish, which entitles me by nature to grow to, by, which entitles me by nature to do three things. Grow a beard, wear a kilt, be able to stomach more obscene amounts of alcohol. I believe, though ponder what sick author would pen such a perverse script as the works of such a manuscript are highly limited. Something is in the way, but I believe in the little places where animals are trapped as the earth hangs in space like some distorted scrotum of questioning where I happen to reside, and realize that children have the purest of prayers as they ask for the safety of parents, school compatriots, nothing of themselves, 
honestly as a junkie looking for a bag or a drunk just trying to get home. I wonder at times, I believe, I cry, but was apparently planned in advance by something far greater than I. So many inquiries as I have, I believe, but who am I to question? Folded into thoughts growing older than our bodies. 
making souls out of memories and mysteries, and, and still missing the point that we are absurd. We spoken words, language in dust, poetry in protein, amino acid adventures, prose still waiting for answers. This is my reason to believe. A fairy tale god poet writing souls into eternity with dust. And just because we read it wrong, it doesn't mean it's bad poetry. So lately, I've been thinking, what if it's all poetry? I mean, if science can only concern itself with the physical emanations of ultimate reality, what if the most fundamental particles are really verbs and nouns? Adjectives, adverbs, and stuff Couplets and rhymes, the elements, sonnets and ballads, the minerals, and the light comes from a person. What if it's all poetry? What if matter is actually made up of what really matters? Our perception of meaning, of scanning an electron microscope, looking closer at the smallest patterns of existence. What if atoms were ions and the rocks merely metaphors? What if it's all poetry? What if relationship is a star exploding with the source of ultimate meaning and conscious awareness is the fuel? What if fools are pollution, broken hearts and black holes of fundamental reality? Selfishness and greed, genetically altered absurdities propagated by brokenness and hurt. What if love is the source and the goal and there have been too many mutations? What if it's all poetry? What if we, thoughtful sparks slipping through the biochemical cracks of biological creatures, are composed of material innuendo, as real as we feel, as important as we hope, as loved as we want to be, and the stuff that makes us dependent upon the words of a lover? What if it's all poetry? What if ancient wisdom had it right all along, and modern science is only catching up? What if Higgs is a field of dreams, giving weight to God's ambition, forming particles from echoes of kindness and patience? I mean, if 96% of the physical universe seems to be dark energy and matter, maybe it's because we're still living in the dark ages. And what matters most is moral and wise. We're only making matter worse by inversion. What if the extra dimensions we find in our math Places we should have gone to. And the infinite universe is birthing infinite possibilities, our infinite poetry flowing from an infinite poet. What if it's all poetry? What if the Large Hadron Collider is telling the truth and everything that is comes from nothing but ideas? What if we are words generating fields that give rise to particles shaped by laws that are molded and connected by elemental attractions? used as ink on this cosmic page of the poetry. In the language of, of life, with words that are personal, us, written with dust, with care and precision, and a vision for the future that ages of edits, mutations of circumstance and egotistical intent, have only managed to alter the reflection of perfection, still finding the author's intention. What if it's all poetry and we find ourselves reading in wonder as our science plunders the pages, denying the poet, insisting on chance? Meter and rhyme unfolding in intricate geology, language and story in physics, and biology, the weight of scribbled matter, psychology, the search for reason in unreasonable space, the search Meaningless traces of eternity, just chance. What if it's all poetry? What if spirit is deeper than flesh? What if what matters is what makes up matter? What makes us matter? And all that matter is now holding this tale like a book. Look, what if it's all a poem spoken to become us? Broken minds with an ultimate it's the only way public would create this. Notice. So this piece 
I wrote for all of my friends. That was an excerpt from a, a 7,000 word poem I wrote called Cosmo Lyrical and I'm hoping to bring it here to Chicago the week before Easter, so keep an eye out for Cosmo Lyrical if you want to hear that the rest of that. Um, this one is uh, a poem I wrote for all of my friends who were so, so mad at Jesus. Because if you ask me, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm not that good at math, and I don't understand the Holy Trinity, but I took trigonometry. What? I took trigonometry three times before I can understand. Okay. You know what? I'm going to start over. That poem's got some rhythm, and I just lost it completely. So it's for all my friends who are so mad at Jesus, because if you ask me, it doesn't add up. I mean, I'm not that good at math, and I don't understand the Holy Trinity, but I took trigonometry three times before I could admit there was anything I would never understand completely. Like, how could you be so mad at a myth? No one holds grudges against Santa and the Tooth Fairy, or mythical beings like Thor and Zeus, when it comes to personal insult and injury. Fictional hallucinations are never abuse. So there's something about Jesus that invites your derision. There's something about Jesus to force a decision, and you may blame religion or someone you know, but 2,000 years is enough time to consider his quid pro quo. So, somewhere between the babbling baby in the manger and the bloody lamb on the cross, he must have made you crazy. Somewhere between turning water into wine and raising the last class with friends, there must have been a moment when things weren't so hazy. Maybe it was that finger in the dust, calling the bluff of those hypocrites ready to toss rocks at some party girl like a bunch of frat boys caught at date rate trying to get rid of the evidence. But what could bother you about that? Or maybe it was that spit in the dust, stirred into mud, and rubbed into the eyes of a man too blind to see who wanted to see, and then did see what you can't see, don't see, won't see. Somehow you still see red every time someone says, he rose from the dead, this Jewish carpenter by day, king of the universe by night, born to vanquish evil and bring eternal life, astride a white horse with his robes, dripping blood, risen from the dead to save the world. I think you just might be upset to take it so long. Because everybody knows this world needs to be saved. After eons of evolution and centuries of social science, we sure as, well, we're not doing a very good job of saving it ourselves. The things we make for good, we still use for bad. The wealth we all create is hoarded by a few. Rich people watch starving people on high-definition television. Educated people sneer at ignorant people who still have questions. We can't stand the need or the greed or the evil men do to people they don't understand. Or the pain and the strain and the hurt inflicted on sons and daughters. We should understand. We ought to be tired of waiting to be free. But does that make him responsible for the damage? I mean, why aren't we more like we want to be? And whoever decided we deserve to be saved, you know, myths aren't hate, and they don't come through for us. No one hates Batman, at least not on purpose. Superman doesn't get his name crafted into curses, and Flash Gordon never got paid to desert us. Wonder Woman wasn't strung up naked on a cross to hang until dead, rejected and mocked, just so we could worship the Joker or, or Lex Luthor in some ritual killing, full moon blood, stupid. Only real gods or devils have that kind of clout. So our wishing well's empty. Except for the doubt went to billions of gods. Three and one doesn't so don't waste your anger on this holy hero, this God-man chimera whose life is a message to anyone willing to see that he's still pulling dying souls out of this wreckage. You know that he's real, and this nightmare keeps taking the places you need to be saved from, making you want to blame someone for sin who will take it and give you back life because you're dying.
co-host time to time on uh, Wednesdays, every Wednesday, second longest running show in Chicago. Just a little plug there, you know, you should check it out. Uh, well, while speaking of plugs, uh, there is a table out front with uh, books and chapbooks and things of that nature from the featured uh, artists tonight. Uh, you should all buy one, like all of them, uh, because they're really good. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to hand the mic, the mic over to my good friend John. And if you've come to the end one here, you know I haven't been writing a lot lately, but Gregory got me inspired to write something new. So. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm serving two purposes. I'm, I'm serving two purposes here tonight. I brought Phil, because I think he's amazing. And then I'm going after Phil, so nobody else has to. <laughs> Whoever's next will feel a lot better. On faith. Faith is believing the Big Bang was triggered by a word spoken by the Word. Believing all the world's problems began with a talking snake and a stolen piece of fruit. Faith is believing God wanted to forgive us but couldn't until we compounded our guilt by killing his innocent son. That a holy God demanded blood be spilled, then spilled his own to satisfy that demand. Faith is believing in a healer who refused to heal his friend because only the dead can be raised. Believing that same healer refused to heal himself because only the dead can be raised. Believing both died and were raised. Believing I will be raised. Faith doesn't add up. It's believing with God. One plus one plus one equals one. one. <laughs> Francisco gets it. But five loaves and two fish equals a feast for thousands and twelve baskets of leftovers. Faith is believing in a poet who wrote himself into his poem, let the characters edit him out, and wrote himself in again. Believing in a God who lived by faith, died by faith, and by faith lives again. Faith is the opium of the people. Like all medicine, it can be dangerous. That's why I need a great physician to give me an appropriate dose. Faith is drinking the Kool-Aid served by a man who turned water into wine and eating the broken body of the bread of life. Faith is believing that my best effort is never good enough and doesn't have to be, but giving my best effort anyway. Faith is pie in the sky, by and by, believing that a homeless Jewish carpenter is building me a mansion that he's already paid for, but I can't live in it until I die, when I shall be more alive than ever. <laughs> Faith isn't blind. It's what allows a blind man like me to see the invisible, illuminated by the light of the world. It isn't a crutch for a cripple. It's when a cripple like me hears a voice say, get up and walk, and strangely find strength in his legs. It's when that cripple rises to his feet, hears his healer say, follow me, and does. Sounds like foolishness, because it is. Faith is embracing folly to become wise, weakness to gain strength, poverty to gain riches, suffering to gain joy, death to gain life, and knowing. I will never understand it. I have to take it. On faith. Thank you. Mr. John Shirk, everybody. Uh, all right, let's see. Coming up next, I'd like to welcome a uh, good friend of mine, a lovely woman um, who <laughs> never holds the same hair color for more than a week. Uh, or so it would seem, uh, Ms. Jessica Fenwick. Would you please approach the stage?
So this is about the living faith of what we can do. And faith to me is believing in something that we don't see sometimes. Um, I survived some things that are pretty incomprehensible that I don't talk about. And later I found out that the director of Johns Hopkins Medical School thought it would be impossible for someone to survive and be able to function after surviving those things, and that's part of where this poem comes from. Um, and last, there is a trigger warning for lady trauma content in the poem. Um, so I just like to get out of there. And the clank will help me out. <laughs> poem for Marie, my Irish grandmother, who died in childbirth. I say this poem for Delia, my Italian grandmother. She raised Marie's killer, gave his father three more babies, even though he told her she couldn't take Marie's place in his heart. For Delia, always the lady, always in heels, cleaning motel rooms, scrubbing toilets, folding hospital corners, always the lady, always in heels and her calf muscles shortened, and she had to wear them. Two, in the dream, the woman stands naked in a bathtub. The tub's floor is slick with her blood. Two men stand outside the tub. They wear clothes. They take turns. One props up her body while the other takes one leg. He turns his back to her. He pins her calf to his body. He snaps a two-by-two two against the sole of her foot. He snaps a two-by-two two against her soul, builds a rhythm, paints fresh bruises over the old ones. Skin splits, another small bone breaks. When he tires, he sets down that crushed blackberry. His partner picks up the other leg. Three. I say this poem for my Polish friend, Kristen. She went on a business trip. She stopped in her hotel bar for a drink after a long day. She was roofied and gang-linked in her hotel room. I say this poem for my Japanese friend, Mo. She went to a house party when she was 16. A group of teenage boys drugged and raped her. Next day at school, the word was she made it happen, and she liked all their bodies tearing into her. I say this poem for that girl from Ohio, the one the boys dragged around like a trophy. I say this poem for the young black women who matter less to a society. I say this poem for my Greek friend, Gwen. She made him enchiladas for their first date. He raped her afterwards. When she told me about it, she said she went outside herself until it was over. So did I, I said, when it happened to me. Four. In the dream, the woman asks the men, who are you? We are your future children, says one, the other snickers. She says, no, my children would never do this. The men's faces harden, flesh shifts to gargoyles masks. We are misogyny, they hiss together. The dream weighs heavy in my not awake yet. Mudalahara, it clicks into sense. The feet are the base, the feet are the root, the first chakra. Mudalahara chakra, the first chakra, the issue being the right to be here. Five, in the dream, she asks, why do you do this? We are misogyny, they hiss. We were conditioned to it. It is our nature. We do as we were taught. I interrupt the dream. I encourage you to do this when you're having a disturbing dream. Just interrupt it and write it out. In the name of the living God, the unseen force of life that loves all of the creatures God gives breath to. In the name of unconditional life, the incomprehensible love of people that you and I, that, that we can't listen to or witness. In the name of unconditional life, the incomprehensible love that humans can't listen to or witness. Unmake the hatred and objectification. Unmake the entitlement condensed into abuse that would deny her standing. Those demons crumble into dust. Six, this wounded woman, what does she look like in your mind? We have all seen her. Some of us have been her. Imagine her skin. Is it rich with melanin, blue-black with lighter palms? 
Is your skin paper white, Irish, willing to show blood and bruises? Is she freckled, bruised, mixed, Asian, ginger, olive, brown, with braids or matted hair, kinked, slick straight, curls, she? Oh, the detail. I have seen her dead in the opening scene of every Law and Order SVU. Heard her say, and then he was inside me. And she's told her life will never be the same. Always raped, ever raped. She weeps now with relief and exhaustion. I invite her to sit on the edge of the tub, and I turn the tap on. Her black and purple split bruised feet are too tender for running water. I tear strips of linen from my garment and soak them and gently wipe her feet. You have the right to be here, sister. You have the right to inhabit your own body. I tear strips of linen from my garment and I swaddle her feet. You have the right to be here, sister. You have the right to inhabit your body.
This isn't a personal end, so enough about me. Though I do like long walks on the beach and candlelight dinners. Uh, <clears throat> right now, uh, please welcome up a, a good friend of mine, Mr. Rob Hanley. Just as a warning, I have several more pieces I'm planning tonight. <laughs> okay, sorry I had to suddenly run out. I may have, I have faith but not in the parking meters here, so I'm going to have to take care of that. Um, I apologize for missing most of your poem, but I did hear the end of it. I just want to let you know. I liked what I heard. Anyway. I have uh, two pieces tonight, one of which is not mine, but it's a piece that's very close to my heart, uh, by John Donne, who's a romantic poet, um, a priest who wrote fantastic poems about faith and fantastic seduction poems in your Yes? Please keep in mind, you are not limited to one piece. You can take anywhere up to like eh, seven minutes or so. If you go to eight and a half, I'm not gonna hurt you. Okay, so just just keep that in mind. <laughs> well, maybe afterwards, but not during the show. So have a little liberty with what you're doing. So yeah. All right, my friend, back to you. <laughs> so yes, first piece by John Dunn, second piece by me. I'm just gonna go straight into it. You'll probably figure out where it transitions because it's going to get a lot less. Batter my heart, three person of God, for you as yet but not breathe, shine and seek to mend. That I may rise and stand, overthrow me and bend, your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like an usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but, it's, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet, dearly I love you. I would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie me, or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free. Nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. I was a Sunday mass every morning, lunch with the family after kind of cat. My mother teaches grammar to middle schoolers in the school run by her church. She is the best candidate for sainthood I am likely to meet, putting up with their hormonal preteens with patience. I don't tell her about my work. Because in my office there are hallways lined with filing cabinets, each drawer devoted to a specific Catholic diocese. Each, each file in that drawer labeled with the name of an abuse victim. You see my dilemma. The world I see daily would make more sense with an Old Testament deity, with fire and brimstone punishments, with pillars of salt for slight offenses. But then, I'd have to assume if my friend's grabbed hair, the forum against her windpipe was her own fault. I'd have to believe there was some reason for every name in those drawers. You see my dilemma. I believe in you, but don't have much faith in you. When the call came with my last grandparent on the way out, I still pressed my hands together and lowered my head to pray. A prayer that was a cross between arguing and begging, struggling against every contradiction this world makes me swallow. You see my dilemma? and believe in a great plan anyway, overseen by some benevolent administrator. Most days, all I can believe in is a jester laughing at a night sky as each star fades away. But I carry a St. Christopher medal in my pocket. And every time I stop to look over a cityscape or countryside stretching to a horizon, I try to reach out to something. Something that says, reaching is the only prayer you need. 
Just see my dilemma. I want so badly for something to reach back, to put some name on this feeling other than God, a name I wore out a long time ago. And I'm no wise man, no theological scholar trying to pronounce some true name of God. I'm just a guy sitting on a rock in Denver or standing in a skyscraper in Chicago, reaching for that sunrise. Praying that will be enough. silent wind which begins to whine like an oboe, then a clarinet, 
a single note rising and falling into the oblivion caught distinctly between two worlds, sunlight in the one above, moonlight in the one below. Yet my island home, Asadia, stops me before I can go. Shipwreck, out of gas, snapped fan belt, a dead cell phone, a broken guitar string. We'd have a ferryman strike before we pay with pennies. Instead, I'm a wee gold beard, memorizing a dialogue, but always alone. My long-haired love of wild eyes and starlight forms a face out of the constellations just for me. Pale, loitering, she recites her lines by rote. Her schemes and tropes call for me to abandon the campfire, wait knee deep, and attempt a miraculous escape into fog, shroud, night, and sea foam. She calls out into the sky, a shrieky sign, siren, tempting me to swim into the black sea. Act, react, dash into bony, bloody rocks until, ex until I expose all that I have inside to her. But I can't. I throw some hemp on the fire instead and enter dreams I've always known. I'm stranded on the island of Asimov. My bottles and their notes roll on the beach. Broken seashells, stretched starfish, driftwoods like crucifixes, monastic despair. I haven't a care in this heavy, heavy world. I grow wings and fly above and below. Look for me the land where you call home. I will bring you everything you need to live alone. I will light a lantern in your breast. Stop it! 
Okay, I just remember. So anyway, this kid would always tease me and tease me. And he was one of the tough kids, so you couldn't, you couldn't fight him over it. And you couldn't tease him back, especially not me, because like I said, I was never good at that. So this, this anger just built up in my head for years and years. Now, I never, I never ever uh, sought vengeance or took vengeance against him or anything like that. But it, it was getting to the point where um, emotionally, I was getting wrapped up in just playing these insults over and over in my head again and again. But it was also messing with me physically. Like, I would start to get these really bad stress headaches. I would just dwell on it so much. You know, and I would always think to myself, you know, I hope, I, I hope he pays for this one day. I hope, I really hope something happens to him because he, he has no right to, to, to make me go through all this emotional pain and physical stress. About a couple of years ago, I was uh, enjoying a Christmas Eve dinner with a good friend of mine, and uh, somehow this kid who bullied me way back in elementary school, he came to the conversation. Um, for the purpose of not exploiting him, I'll just say his name is FK. Alright, so me and my friend are talking, and uh, FK was a really good basketball player back in elementary school. He was the only kid in our class tall enough to actually dunk the ball. And all the high schools were trying to get him to come to their school so, they could, so he could make their team really great. He was an amazing basketball player. And one night as me and my friend are talking, uh, FK comes to the conversation, and uh, my friend goes, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I was really thinking that I was going to see uh, FK on TV today because looking at all these college basketball teams, and I I I'm not seeing him. And then my friend's mother comes in and says, yeah, you didn't hear about that? And we were both like, no. I said, oh, well, yeah, uh, FK is, can't play basketball anymore. I said, why is that? said, well, um, he has a heart condition now, and even though he's still a really good ball player despite his condition, all the colleges are a little too scared to take him on because they consider him a health risk. So now he can't achieve his dream. Now, to take things to an even higher level, FK had a younger brother who, if you watch college ball, you may have seen him on TV. He plays for... I believe he even plays for Oregon State. But um, anyway, this little brother's four years younger than FK, and now he's six inches taller than FK, and he is considered one of the best players for Oregon State now. Everyone on TV is always talking about him, and now he's always complimenting him, like, wow, he, he, he made a good dunk, he did a good this, did a good that. You know, so it, it, it's interesting. Um, this, this, this one kid is, you talk about revenge, this one kid, who has been teased me for the first half of my life is now stuck with a heart condition and can't achieve his basketball dreams. Now, this reminds me of an episode of South Park. Uh, have you ever seen an episode where Carpenter gets AIDS? Anyone seen that? And uh, Kyle hears about it and he goes, oh my God, Carpenter has HIV? Excuse me, I need to be alone. And he goes outside and you think he's gonna cry, but instead he starts laughing. Hysterically. And then a couple scenes later, Kyle starts laughing at Carpenter again. And then Kyle laughs so hard, he's like, excuse me, I gotta go home. He just runs away and starts laughing. And Carpenter says, now we're in a church, I'm gonna say this in a G-rated fashion. I'm not gonna quote Carpenter directly, but he says, can you believe that da-da-da-da? He has no compassion. And Stan goes, Carpenter, Kyle does feel bad for you. He just thinks it's Ironic. Ironic how? Well, Carmen, you're always such a jerk and stuff. What? So you think I deserve it? Is that what you think, Stan? No, not me. But I don't think so. I'm not gonna say I, I, I'm not that low and evil to, to say that I was rejoicing at FK's problem. But I knew that I wasn't sad, but I also knew that that kind of made me, it meant that there was still a demon inside me that I, I had to get out. Uh, it, it, it's funny, my good friend Francisco and I were reading uh, the book of Mark and he was talking about uh, 
how Jesus comes across this guy named Legion who was just full of all these demons. And uh, Jesus is able to take all these demons out of them and cast them into pigs. I think I'm going to have to go find a pig. Because there is a part of me that wants to be happy about this guy's heart disease, but I know that I shouldn't be. Because in Leviticus it says that vengeance is that of God and not of mine. God did this to FK, not me. But the worst part about it is that there's a small part of me that thinks the reason God did this to him is what was, was for me. You know? This guy now has heart disease. Merry Christmas, Charles West. <laughs> This guy can't play basketball. Happy birthday, Charles West. This guy's little brother is achieving all his dreams for him and he has to sit back and watch. Happy Tuesday, Charles West. It's a strange feeling that I feel. I can tell that this demon of vengeance still lives inside me to, to, to a degree. And I, I just, you know, like I said, I, I want to find a pig or something that I can just put this demon into and get rid of for the for the rest of my life this 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 evil in me that i don't want but for some reason i'm so enticed by because it seems like fk is getting what he deserves but who am i to say that maybe he got it for a different reason and who's to say that i'm not gonna come down with some strain i mean or what i'm not gonna catch some crazy disease, but I mean, who's to say? You know, I, I, I do my best to believe in God and, 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 uh, and believe that whatever happens is because he wanted it to happen. Now, if he wants me to get sick, I'll get sick too. I'm praying that he doesn't. But for the time being, all I need is a pig. And for the past two and a half years, that pig has been a microphone. Going to poetry slams, hip hop joints, putting my demons into this pig, and then passing it to the next artist. Now, hopefully, this pig will not regurgitate into the next person that steps up here, but I certainly hope that through this, I can sort of get rid of this vengeful idea, this vengeance that does not belong to me, that never belonged to me, but instead, belong to God. For whatever reason, FK is sick, God chose it. Was it out of vengeance? Perhaps not. I'm not sure. All I know is, by the time I'm done, this pig will be full. Let's keep in mind that pig was kind of metaphorical <laughs> in, in, in that, that there, there weren't really that many pigs as Jews wouldn't eat that many pigs as Jews don't eat pork at all. Um, and it was only the Roman soldiers and there was way more pigs than to accommodate that. Okay, that, that's not what this is about. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's see. Um, all right, so let, let, let's give a round of applause for this.
my first two names both mean warlike, and my last name means one who lives beautifully, and I'm not sure what's weighted heavier. For the longest time, I thought the clouds would just roll on by. But it rained. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And when the waters rose, I couldn't bear the pain, so I took the olive branch offered to me like the hope that it was. I finally learned to ignore the swelling sea. If you could believe it, I was exact when I put my pen to paper. I signed a suicide pact with the creator of the universe. And I couldn't have done worse holding up my end of the deal. All I had to do was die to myself and I could be free and be healed. Well, I've drank an awful lot of poison, but killing selfishness is harder than it seems. Much, much harder than it seems. Because I'm still just like me. And I feel more like a demon than I ever wanted to be. And I don't know why that is or why it is that whenever I want to be close to you, I have to try so hard. We never just hang out anymore, God, and so we've grown apart like one-sided lovers tend to do. I still believe that if I give up, you'll fix me through and through, but I haven't seen the honest insides of my heart in a long, long time, and I'm terrified to look at what's happened there. Because I've been low for so long. I've been low for so long. I've been low for so long. I can't go any deeper. I've never been weaker. So if you could just capture my heart again, I promise I'll be a good hostage this time. I'll take that Stockholm Syndrome like a pill, or a blood pill, or a rope over the edge of a cliff, because I need constant saving. And I need grace enough to take my place so that when I don't have the strength to give my life away completely, you'll have the strength to pick me up and make me. But I'm so familiar with my family, wandering this hallway, turning the lights on, turning the lights off so bored, so lonely, and yet never asking for your company. I'm so tired of all of my addictions and all of the traps I've tripped and fossilized evils I've rediscovered, hoping to satisfy my heart of unearth nothing. I haven't found joy in any of the feelings bloated out of proportion or in the numbness that comes from denying my dog. So I end up open and close, like a palm and a fist, open enough to admit that I spend hours when I'm alone just staring at a whiskey bottle, asking myself, why not? But not open enough to admit why. Because I'm still holding on to secrets I've tried to convince myself are a lie. And if you know everything that I keep hidden, that I keep caged as well as I can, and if you know my heart, the heart of any man, then you know I'm not much of one. Forgive me for every day I've got coming up. My faith is a thimble cup, and I will try to find something better than you every day, drinking it down with poison. But oh, what a wonder it is that your antidote grace is stronger than all of it, and stronger than me. And then without asking, you give out forgiveness like each of my betrayals really was just a kiss. And what I've found is this. That even if I die to myself, I will still need your help. I still need your help. And so I'm slowly learning how to ask you to fulfill both sides of our suicide pact. Sorry about my like cotton mouth like a snake up here. It's also new, so I'm just gonna do this. <clears throat> you
You're just fine And your song is a sweet, sweet melody And I'm not When I was born, God strung my chest with violin strings Stretched a drum skin from ear to ear across my neck And he tied my arms and legs up with woodwinds and piano keys So that when I walked, I sounded like a symphony of innocence but I've long since smashed those instruments and filled my chest with brimstones like all hell is trying to get out. I'm just wondering when does a museum of instruments stop being a memory of deception and start sounding like music again? Because the difference between a weed and a flower is perspective, right? Like sometimes a stiff drink and a cigarette are a flower, and sometimes a stiff drink and a cigarette are a weed, but most times I don't know the difference. <coughs> I'm wondering if I open up my mouth with truth once, will the cobweb stop forming over my tongue? If I wasn't so angry, would I have anything left to say at all? If my heart rusted out like I said it does, is there any oil left to fix my ears? Because oh, I'm a poet. And so I curse myself with this openness. Damn it, I can't keep putting this pen to paper in hopes that someone will find me. And yet I do. Publish my letters when I'm gone. Don't forget to put in the editorial that I was a very private person. I didn't want to be remembered for anything anybody didn't like, so I take back everything, even this. But everyone wants to be told they're okay. And they can do it, and I don't want to make any enemies, so you're okay. You're okay. You're okay just like you are. There's nothing to improve, and let that be your morphine, so you can feel numb, so you can feel better. Does it sound true? Or I say you've done nothing. Because if you told me this day, you know why. But this tired message was never about behavior modification. It's always been about anger, my anger. My mom and dad used to say I had to learn self-control or it would destroy me. Well, I stopped throwing chairs just this last summer. And I don't think the pages out of my books anymore, but I still know what it feels like to put up in at 211 degrees my whole life right on the edge. And the coolness of Jesus seems to move at a glacial pace towards me. Where is it right now? I know I need more help than I can come up with on my own. I will gladly accept the crutch. Others deny it, pride, but not you. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay just like you are. You can't relate to any of this feeling. The gospel's only designed for my kind of healing. And you have your own morality, and that's just fine. You are the one slamming the doors. But as for me, I would rather have mercy than morality. Because God knows I needed a real hell of a lot more. Don't tell me I'm all right. I can't forgive myself and move on. I wasn't the only one I'm hurt. I'm sorry for every turn I made when I should have kept straight and swings of these fists and the words of my lies. And when does the Museum of Instruments stop sounding like a memory of deception and start sounding like music again? Because I'm as heavy as the boulders on the ocean floor, and forgiveness is the only thing holding out a hand strong enough to pick me up. And I want to hear music again. I want to hear music again, but the depths of the oceans of my wrongs make everything sound like drownings. If you're on the surface still, and your song sounds like a sweet, sweet melody, you must not realize how deep the waters of your past are, because the only difference between your plain, grinding sounds and the beauty of real music, of real life, is not perspective, it is position. The position of your soul, and my soul, in relation to a holy, perfect God. And the gospel has always been about our anger, and it's always been about our pride, and the changing down of an aesthetic comment about a tune that sounds more like music than you can imagine. You're just fine, and your song is a sweet, sweet melody. Mr. Marty, folks, that was fantastic. Uh, let's see, I'm going to invite up a uh, very good friend of mine, Miss Robin Fine. Where are you? There you are. Okay. Um, she usually does these uh, kind of erotic 
not so churchy pieces, but she's reformed apparently and agreed to, to, to do something along the lines of faith. So we're going to be cool with that and just kind of see what happens. And uh, just as a reminder, um, many of the authors you see here tonight uh, have material, including myself, uh, such as chapbooks, CDs, things like that, just outside those doors. And if you don't already own them, you should. And many of them are pretty affordable, even on my salary. Do this for a living. So you should check those out. In the meantime, this will be fun. First of all, I want to thank you for putting this together. It was very cool. Um, yeah, this is something that I don't normally write about, but as I thought about it, I looked around to see what I could find in one of the poems I wanted to do. It was not written by me, but a very good friend. Most of you know him as Buddha 309, Dave Hardgarden from uh, Waiting for the Bus Collective, so I thought I'd start with this one. God was, uh, God was evicted today. They thought it was heaven, previous tenants have called it other things. Back before the pearly gates with the refractions of immortal light was the only road here she was called Asgard or Valhalla. The boxes are stacked near the curb, angels in coveralls handling all things with care. It's only been a few thousand years. People used to live forever, have a million offspring. Faith was rewarded by happiness and history. <laughs> and God stared at the cathedrals and castles. He took at last, he took a last look at the majestic heaven and saw that it once was good. You can't build things on faith, not anymore. The passage of time weakens the foundation. It was a simple structure. God equals love equals faith. faith. Faith which is separate from truth, and we are supposed to learn to change, to grow. That is why free will is there. The men in funny hats say that God equals love equals faith plus rules. You know, the crusades tell of evangelism, and the walls begin to weather. This land was once Olympus, and Atlas held the heavens in place. At least there was a god of war. They killed in my name, God mumbled while packing the last of his collectible t-shirts and shot glasses. Faith is currency. Faith is conversation. Faith is art. Rent cannot be paid with lip service. God was evicted today. His bag sent on a hand of courtesy chariot driven by Apollo on its way to the retired deity's home. Security deposit lost. Maybe the next tenant will have a better luck. Faking a smile, God placed the key beneath the welcome mat and hangs a sign that simply states, Alice doesn't live here anymore. This one was actually really hard for me because I am religious and I have a, a very strong faith. How it affects me and how it's impacted me while I was growing up. Um, I grew up on the north side in, in Womat, and I was raised reformed, but never seemed to fit in with the reformed until I discovered spirituality. So this actually was written this morning, so I hope you like it. So I'll never name. In Judaism, it is the female that maintains the bloodline while the male is placed on a pedestal. I never understood this blind faith, follow God without question. I lived with constant bruised knees, bruised knees and split lips from trying to climb upward. But good little Jewish girls were meant to be quiet and compliant. Know how to keep house, make sons, make perfect chicken soup. This was my privilege of faith. Mother's words always filled with disdain. Why can't you be more like the other good little Jewish girls? They love and obey their mothers. Hurtful words leave scars beyond broken bones. I was this forgotten. I was this foster child. The one who didn't belong, always on the outside looking in. But every Sunday, there was synagogue. 
my refuge, my salvation. I would live inside the stories of ancient Palestine. Each Hebrew letter bathed me in light, gave me back my human spirit. Mother's discontent faded into sand as I was a daughter of Israel, a holy warrior like Leah and Rachel, carrying their history on my back. Their human scars became my body armor. God would never trample me on my garden again, no longer his privilege. I would crawl into the back seat of my dad's old Buick, breathing my own reflection smashed against the window. It was time to be schooled, transported back to Persia and Egypt. Freshly polished leather seats became my saddle. Lakeshore Drive, the cattle routes. Lake Michigan, the Sea of Galilee. Teachers shared stories of old Jerusalem, of temples built and destroyed and built and destroyed again. We were God's chosen people. And behind every great warrior, there was a the strength of a woman. Abraham had Sarah, Moses had, Moses had Miriam, Jacob had Rachel. Someone would have me. I would be his knee for air. I would speak these words into existence if only God would grant me an audience. But good little Jewish girls do not embarrass their mothers. If I had a daughter, I would build her a ladder, teach her to climb, revel in her bruised knees and split lips. I would teach her that I would teach her that humanity is her birthright. She was not meant to be chained to someone else's ego in God's name. That ancient wisdom is beginning, middle, and end to never forget her true origins, and that the pedestal would always be for her, always be hers for the taking. Yeah. Yeah. Along those lines, as, as women and as being Jewish, um, you know, we are prostitute, we are the mother, we are the sister. Please take as much time as possible as you can on the microphone. When I say seven minutes, I mean seven minutes. Otherwise, you're just going to hear me reading a lot more stuff. So give it to the artists that have come here that are, to, to actually do something productive instead of me just exercising my own ego because I, I don't need that. So let's give it up. Let's, let, let, let's, let, let's give it up. I will tell you a story of Maharaja Knights in painted veils. She is a dream behind eyelids, translucent fantasy. Her hips offer no protestation. She will draw you in with the rhythm of her skin, quench her thirst and your desire. There is God in the melody of her fingertips, a carnal dance between shadow and shape, each footprint etched in sand, a dream's lost taste of desert heat, sandpaper rough. There is God. In the rhyme of her body, liquid gold courses through veins of imagination. Each thrust of her hip calls out to a Bedouin's drum. There's God. In the sway of her breast, she will paint you a universe of longing and desire in shades of rubies and emeralds. All you need is a glimpse to breathe in her beauty. She is your Persian princess, if only for pretend. Pray for a taste before shadow and shape she says that's it as though like she just got up on stage and was like uh yo what up and meanwhile that was freaking beautiful so let's do that show right now. So let's take a little break, uh, say about uh, 10 minutes or so. Go out, get yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, bathrooms are on the fourth floor. Uh, have a smoke, get a cookie, whatever you want to do. I don't care. Uh, just be back here in about 10 minutes. You'll see the uh, stylings of uh, Billy Tuttle. Yeah. I see a lot of that. as well. So, come on back. Before you run off, just wanted to welcome you here to People's Church of Chicago. I'm Pastor Jean Darling. Uh, we have services on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, if you care to join us. Can we sing here? 
No. <laughs> Sleep here and then stay for service? Yeah. Let me think about that. <laughs> we have... I'll, I'll think about it later. Um, we are co-sponsoring this event. We are really glad to have, have had you organize this. Uh, the Treasures of Uptown is an interfaith group that was started out of this church, but has many different faiths involved. Uh, we have a monthly uh, discussion group that meets over at the Pan Golden Pancake House uh, with you know a handful of people from all different faiths, and we talk about some subject, and we periodically have public events like this one or other kinds of events, uh, and. Uh, we welcome others' participation in our group. We have some information out front, too. So enjoy your break. Uh, spend money. Thank you for coming. All right, let's see who we all meet back here in about 10-ish uh, minutes or so.